Good morning and thank you for waiting. Welcome to the conference call to discuss Banco Santander Brasil SEA's results. Present here are Mr. Sergio Rial, Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Angel Santo Domingo, Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Mr. André Parisi, Head of Investor Relations. All the participants will be in a listen-only mode during the presentation, after which we will begin the question and answer session when further instructions will be provided. If you need any assistance during the presentation, please call the operator by pressing star zero. The live webcast of this call is available at Banco Santander's Investor Relations website at www.santander.com.br ri, where the presentation is also available for download. We would like to inform that questions received via webcast will have answering priority. If you wish to ask a question via phone, please press star one. Once your query is answered, press star 2 to leave the line. Each participant is entitled to ask one question. If any further information is required, please re-enter the line. Before proceeding, we wish to clarify that forward-looking statements may be made during the conference call relating to the business outlook of Banco Santander Brasil, operating and financial projections and targets based on the beliefs and assumptions of the executive board, as well as information currently available. Such forward-looking statements are not a guarantee of performance. They involve risks, uncertainties, and assumptions, as they refer to future events and hence depend on circumstances that may or may not occur. Investors must be aware that general economic conditions, industry conditions, and other operational factors may affect the future of Banco of performance of Banco Santander Brasil and may cause actual results to substantially differ from those in the forward-looking statements. I will now pass the word to Mr. André Parisi. Please, Mr. Parisi, you may proceed. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our earnings conference call. Once again, in 2019, we had important achievements, which will be presented today by our CFO, CEO, Mr. Sergio Real as well as our positioning to the year ahead. Then our CFO, Mr. Angel San Domingo, will provide more details on our fourth quarter and full year results. Now I turn it over to Mr. Sergio Real. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you everyone for attending our release. So this is the fourth year of continued growth, profitable growth, as you have seen now with the ending of last year. Uh, some of the interesting drivers have, have basically been capped. One is uh, our credit portfolio and particularly also our risk models have proven to be uh, well managed and we're gonna explore that a little bit more. Highly engaged people, we continue to be a story of transformation. Uh, we tend to reject tags of banks or non-banks. We believe we are in a sort of a process where at the end, everything will converge and we're gonna be seeing the beginning of new financial platforms, financial services platforms. And we think, and at least we try and work each and every day to position ourselves to be on the leading front in terms of being first, being ahead, and as much as possible, anticipate possible trends. And I think we've done some of that over the last four years. We've done that in the agro business. We've done that in the real estate business when people were not necessarily paying attention on the back of uncertainties around macro. And we certainly have done that also uh, in the consumer finance space. And, and I think the year of 19 sort of consolidates some of the particular choices we made, not all of them necessarily uh, consensus driven, but uh, particular choices we made that proved to be correct. So in slide 10, it's the summary where we basically ended. We ended with a net profit of 14.6 billion reais, an important growth on a year-to-year -year basis, as you can see. Very important indicator as far as ROE. So we were able to go above 21%, 21.3%. Uh, you probably remember our three-year targets. We have also been able to basically comply and fulfill a promise around efficiency. So we have posted uh, a challenging efficiency ratio. You probably remember our guidance as far as efficiency is around 38. And, uh, and we'll continue, as you see, continue to pay attention on the revenue side. I did mention slide 10, but I may have made a mistake on the number because that's certainly someone is signaling here to me. So we're talking about slide five. So 
uh, apologize for indicating the wrong number of the slide. So we are on slide five. Now moving to slide six, uh, what we have here, it's also a sort of a snapshot where we were. So good performance of the stock last year, 21%, uh, good, strong. Uh, we have also, and we are also very proud of being able to post the highest dividend we have ever done in the country for Santander Brazil, 10.8. Uh, providing, giving an interesting and appropriate yield. I mean, this is more than just a very concrete signal that shareholders, we care about them. We take, we, we give money back uh, when we feel our capital ratios, as is in the case today, are adequate. So I think it's been a very good balance over the last four years of uh, appropriate, bold dividend payouts, but yet paying attention to our capital ratios that certainly allows us to continue to grow as we have done over the last couple of years. On slide seven, now moving to what I would call our culture and our people, very important. I mean, I have been a very strong voice on the importance of transforming the human capital before you can even talk about technology. And I think Santander Brazil has been at least a challenging, intriguing story of what people would normally call a legacy bank to transform itself not only in terms of engagement, as you can see, 92 is best in class, no matter which geography you would be paying attention to, but also in terms of velocity, propensity to take intelligent risks, and creating a, a human capital fabric that we have not seen necessarily in the more classic large universal banks. So you can see also a very important component of our culture, which is continuous learning. I'm a big believer that learning Companies that are very adaptable, but that take very seriously continuous learning. It's an important combination for us to continue transforming ourselves and being as much as possible ahead of the curve. On diversity, we've made uh, bold moves. We are very proud to basically realign uh, without necessarily touching on meritocracy. Diversity for us, besides the right thing to be done, has a very important component with our business model. So uh, we've made a number of things. We ha are now in this year uh, bringing a number of foreigners uh, into Santander Brazil. We're actually recruiting overseas. So English will be more and more heard in the elevators of the company. So English has to become more of a common fluid lingua franca inside of Santander Brazil. Not because we're at the international bank, because that's where the world is. And I think that's all part of what I would call a diversity agenda. Happy to mention we, we are 25% of our population are black, of black descent. We're very proud of it. And we're certainly moving on female leadership now at 26%. We are proud to have three board members who are female. We take that seriously, not because they're female, because they're bright. And on top of that, they have a phenomenal career as female executives, uh, either in the past or still in the case. On slide, on the next slide, we have the client I mentioned. Uh, I, what I would pay attention is the correlation that exists around growth on active customers, but also growth on loyal customers. So there's a very close correlation which shows that the traction and the engine in terms of customer acquisition seems to be going in the right direction. direction. NPS, we're proud, we pay attention. We have not yet uh, exceeded 60. That was something we were looking at. So we're not there yet. So quite a bit of work. So we'll certainly make sure that that's going to be the case. We will continue to work in that direction. So proud to announce 26 million customers and, and many of them, uh, hopefully with the 56, an indication, moderately happy with the bank, but more importantly, also we're still able to generate customer base with profitability. On the next slide, which is slide nine, we're now moving to the quadrant which I would talk about society. And I think a number of things we're very proud. I mean, we were basically awarded by the Fortune, US Fortune magazine as one of the very few companies that is transforming the world. And it's a big statement, but it basically crowns the effort around building a very significant microfinance uh, platform in the country. We have reached over uh, 500,000 customers, as you have seen here on the slide. 
we are aiming actually to hit, reach a million. That's our guidance as far as the next three years. But our ambition is a lot bolder than that. Brazil is fundamentally being, I mean, the success of Brazil, not only, but part of the success of Brazil, of an operation in Brazil, is to be able to crack the code of the base of the pyramid. And I think what the microfinance operation or business model is actually helping us is to be more effective in handling, doing, expanding in a phenomenal and really interesting country that is Brazil. Brazil is not, it's, it's a society of 80% plus urbanized, but even with that level of urbanization, there are many significant extracts which are today not really being attended on a recurrent basis by financial platforms. Uh, very, very important uh, signal this year. We have uh, aligned, or at least we have called all the employees on a voluntary basis to donate 1% of their variable comp to any cause they consider to be an important cause for themselves. So everyone can choose whatever they want. Again, it's voluntary, but we are basically instilling a sort of an important culture to give back. And I think uh, this is an important piece. And it is not just to give the money. It is to think about where the money should go, take ownership of different causes in the Brazilian society, and make a difference. So in the case of Amigo de Valor, which is a program which has been in place many, many years, we're basically supporting 65 social projects of all kinds of different nature. And we have basically raised uh, very close to 20 million reais year on year. So that's a growth of 39% uh, when you compare to last year. And I think it is important to mention, I would like to honor the volunteers of Santander. We have, we have seen 83,000 participations of Santander employees in all kinds of different uh, events, most of them certainly uh, related to some level of either environmental or social component. Moving on, still on, uh, on the business side, I think, I think you have seen on the first slide the growth that we have been able to do it in terms of quota, market share, and credit. We're not particularly pursuing market share target, but it's a reflection of where we are going. And here, I think you, have, you can see significant stakes and growth year on year on a variety of products. I mean, the real estate, the mortgage finance, we started about three years ago, pretty much ahead. We were the first ones to basically bring rates to single digit. On the right side, we have a number of new businesses. Some of those businesses are going to become significant in my view. Santander Auto, the partnership with our friends from HDI, we are looking at uh, being able to underwrite over 100,000 insurance policies for cars this year. So this is a business that if it's well developed and well run, it can be in the billion category from an enterprise value point of view. We have launched Ben, our food voucher, uh, growing, should be able to get into minor profitability range this year already. This is in existence for less than a year now. And in the wholesale side, Corporate Investment Bank, we're proud to be number one in M&A, in project finance and FX. In M&A in particular, a lot to do with having worked on a number of very significant sell mandates uh, last year. Moving to the next one, which is obsession around efficiency, productivity. And those are very small examples of what we are doing. It's difficult to depict in one slide what we are doing. But for example, when you look at just straight current accounts, we, in many, many processes, and particularly significant processes, when you're dealing with 26 million customers, there is so much waste in the, in the design, in the deal flow, and this is just trying to show you that from the historic level of rework that we had for opening, onboarding a customer, we have been able to reduce dramatically rework that at the end only triggers additional costs, inefficiencies, and all kinds of waste of time. So here it is just a, a, a small example of our commitment to really bring our efficiency level to the 38 target in the year 2022. So 
I, I would summarize very solid year, growth component to permeating most of what we did, uh, significant gains of market share on a number of fronts, an organization that posts potentially uh, the best efficiency ratio of the entire uh, industry in Brazil, which is not a minor because we only have very, very good competitors in every dimension. And with that, I'll pass the word to the CFO, Angel Santo Domingo, to start basically talking about the group and take it take us forward. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Sergio. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, let me start uh, in slide uh, 13 with the groups that were already presented by the group, uh, as we always do. Uh, as you know, uh, results, the net profit presented by the group uh, totaled eight, a little bit more than 8 billion euros. Uh, Brazil weighted 28% on those results on the full year, uh, with a breakdown of approx 47% Europe, 53% uh, uh, what we would call America, divided in between 37 and 16, in between South and North America, respectively. Sound results and diversified. Moving to our domestic uh, situation, uh, and in especially on the macro side, um, we summarize there what is what are our views on the economic uh, uh, on the economic frontier. Our expectation is that this year, 2020, will be a year with uh, controlled inflation, low interest rates, and higher growth. This growth will be materialized gradually throughout the quarters. In fact, we expect uh, moving from weaker to stronger quarters as the year goes on. This situation will also be supported by the structural reforms agenda, fiscal policy, and other political initiatives that could offset somehow the expected volatility, both domestic and international, that we are living. We have an in any case, we have an optimistic view on how the economy will evolve since the country's fundamentals are improving and remain solid. Uh, going into specifically what we uh, what are the results uh, in slide 16, 17, sorry. Uh, with regards to our uh, 19, 2019 net income, uh, it reached 14.6 billion reais, still growing at a good pace of 17% in the year. Compared to 2016, that is three years ago, our net, inca in net income has doubled. This performance is a consequence of the key pillars that define our study and that you can see there on, the, on this slide. So, including constant expansion of our customer base, it's already 55 consecutive months in a row that we have been growing our clients, leading to uh, robust and sustainable growth, accurate risk models and disciplined cost control efforts. We have a clear agenda focused on promoting lean growth and productivity gains uh, that have been all, already commented by Sergio, which should provoke further increases both uh, in uh, PNL and net income going forward. On slide 18, we present the main lines of our results, about which I will go into a little bit more detail later on. Let me share with you my initial, initial thoughts. On the revenue front, NII increased almost 5% relative to third Q, while in the full year it rose 6%, 6.4%, with a consistent performance in all of its components. Fees advanced 1.5% in the quarter and 8% in the year. Here, our customer base expansion that I was mentioning in greater transactionality played a critical role in maintaining our fee growth at a healthy level. On the expense side, provisions remained under control, declining 7% in the quarter and staying flat in this in the year. This performance reflects the continuous solvency of our risk models that they have been sharing with you already for some years. General expenses also remained under control. Even though expenses were slightly higher than inflation for the year, they remained below revenue growth, fast improving efficiency. Seasonality explains the quarterly performance. On slide 19, you may see our NII concrete evolution, which totaled almost 47 billion in 2019, increasing 6% in the year. Highlights are, loan NII remained virtually flat in the quarter due to a more balanced growth in between corporates and retail, 
confirming that what I have commented in past quotes and specifically do, during our investor day, which is that the change of mix will be milder in the future. In the full year, loan and AI climbed eight, more than 8%. <laughs> Revenues from funding continued its expansion process and grew 2.6% Q and Q, even though the SELIC rate fell to its lowest level, as you know. On a yearly comparison, it increased 11% relative, relative to 2018. Here, our good volume and price control policies have been key. Finally, the other concept posted a strong result in fourth Q with the prop task delivering better figures when compared to previous quarter. In any, in any way, in the yearly compari comparison, this line was stable. Moving to the next slide, we can see how our loan portfolio growth has accelerated, rising 6% in the quarter and 15% in the year, totaling 352 billion reais. We continue to grow in a controlled and solid way. Analyzing by segment, SME and corporate portfolios have, been, have gained velocity lately. Main points are individuals maintain a good expansion pace, increasing 5% in the quarter and 17 in the year, led by, led by payroll, loans, mortgages, and credit cards. Consumer finance kept its, kept its solid trend and grew 16% leveraging from our full auto ecosystem. The SME portfolio recorded further expansion based in between others in a substantial, substantial improvement in our customer interface. We are already growing at a 15% level in yearly terms. Finally, the corporate loan book following several quarters of a weak evolution delivered a positive performance. It expanded 8% in Q and Q and 12% year on year. So we believe it is too early to say that this, this is a trend for 2020. All in all, we have finished 2019 with better growth trends than our at the beginning of the year. On slide 25, you may see how our funding increased on both quarterly and yearly basis. All its components performed well, positively, except for the most expensive instrument, financial bills, letras financieras. This dynamic is in line with our strategy of optimizing our funding costs that I have been saying already for four years now, and volume at levels that support our long growth volume. Moving on to, moving, moving on to fees, they totaled uh, almost 19 billion in 2019, growing 8% in the year. Highlights in the period were current account, insurance, and wholesale banking. Cards went up 6%, partially impacted by a much tougher competitive landscape through 2019 in the acquiring business, but at the same time, indicating that issuer activity dynamics remain sound. On the next slide, asset quality maintains a very positive evolution. The early arrears ratio kept its declining trend and reached 3.9%, the best level since our IPO, that is, best level in the in the last 10 years the um within these early arrears the individuals segment delivered an improvement of 50 basis points in the quarter the corporate segment posted a slight deterioration but it still remains at a very comfortable level the over 90 day mpl the, also improved in the quarter both segments individuals and corporates recorded good figures, falling 10 and, and 10 and 20 basis points, respectively. And finally, coverage ratio. We have uh, Here I have to, to detail that we have used the one-off tax credit gain to reinforce our balance sheet, anticipating the IFRS 9 implementation in the country. I will elaborate on this effect further on in any case. As a result, the coverage ratio increased to 209% which in our view is again a comfortable level. On slide 24, you can see that loan loss provisions were kept under control, thanks to the improvement in the loan book asset quality. As a result, our cost of credit reached 2.7%. In the full year comparison, provisioning expenses remained flat against uh, 2018, 
while at the same time, as you, as you saw and as I mentioned, the loan portfolio increased 15%. Plus, the cost of credit came as, came as low as 3%. Next slide, we, show, we see how our expenses have trended in the period. Expenses perform well in the fourth Q when compared to fourth Q18, growing only 3%, while the quarterly figure is explained by seasonality. Overall, in 2019, expenses went up by 4.8%, below our revenue growth of 6.8%, and around the 4.3% of inflation, resulting in a better efficiency ratio due to our operating leverage. In 2020, we seek to further intensify our focus on improving our productivity, as has been already said, as we see it as a key, as key to maintain profitability at healthy levels. Moreover, our commented agenda on industrializing a non-industrialized sector in these uh, regards remains even stronger than before. Moving to on to indicators, they showed a good evolution last year compared to 2018. Efficiency was 80 base bips better, recurrency ratio reached 88%, and as mentioned before, thanks to all these advances, return on equity reached 21.3%. I must say that on an annual basis, we are at historical levels in both or in, in the three ratios that I mentioned, return on equity, efficiency, and recurrence ratios. Or recurrence. Looking at capital and liquidity, we closed the year on a solid point with comfortable ratios even after we paid 7.8 billion dividends in fourth Q. We see our capital at a comfortable level to support our growth. Before moving on to the final remarks, I would like to share with you what I've uh, mentioned, slightly mentioned uh, in the past slide, in a past slide, that as you know, taxes on net income, with a, what it is called the local CSLL rate, applicable to banks, will increase from 15 to 20%, so a total of from 14 to 40 to 45%, beginning next March 1st. With this, we have re-evaluated re our DTAs, our deferred tax assets, which generated a one-time net tax credit gain of 2.7 billion reais, which we have offset by strengthening our balance sheet with extraordinary provisioning for loan losses, anticipating the IFRS 9 I mentioned implementation in Brazil, and for an efficiency fund in between others. So moving to my final remarks, to, to conclude the presentation, I would like to underscore the following, three points. Revenues increased 7% in the year, maintaining our growth story. Asset quality figures provide evidence that MPL is and quality is under control, and efficiency remains a key strategic pillar for Santander Brazil. These features were fundamental to our 17 net income growth in 2019 and 21.3% return on equity for the year, which, as I said, is a historical maximum since uh, we were quoted. In our view, our numbers further confirm that we are on the right track to keep delivering solid and sustainable results. I thank you everyone for the attention and now we are available to answer your questions. Okay, moving on, as Mr. Rano said, we are open the Q&A session. We're going to start with the questions received via webcast. First question is from Tito Labarda, Goldman Sachs. Do you think you can maintain ROE at 21% this year, given the headwinds of the cap and overdraft rates and higher tax rate? Sergio, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think the same question somehow also came when we had basically indicated a three-year goal for ROE because of a completely different inflection point that we are seeing in the Brazilian uh, financial system. I think where what I think I basically position the organization is that we will continue to be 
a highly focused organizational return on equity. And I also believe we are in the beginning of that journey. I mean, we've done quite a bit over the last four years. It's important to also perhaps acknowledge uh, I have, if things go the way they look, they might be going from a macro point of view. Cost of equity in Brazil should decline structurally. But one has to remember that we have passed a very important fiscal law on the pension reform, but we are not yet, we are not yet with a country that it's balanced from a fiscal point of view. So there's quite a bit of work to still to happen. So all in all, I don't see, although I see pressure on margins and spreads uh, at this point in time, my read for the marketplace would be perhaps increased potentially funding costs, but also on the asset side, the industry will probably look and rebalance its spreads. I would see in some products, I could see uh, its spreads moving up as Brazil uh, gets realigned. So I'm, I'm not yet concerned uh, as far as the first quarter. Now, asset quality. Um, I was particularly concerned last year on individuals. I still remain uh, on alert. I think there's quite a bit of uh, new entry uh, companies, agents providing credit. So I think we need to be very uh, diligent that we don't have a situation of uh, ferocious competition and basically um, reducing, uh, debilitating cost of credit and risk parameter. So we have been able to do a good job last year, but that will be still very much uh, at the top of our agenda. Can cost of risk come down? I think in certain products, yes. I think yes. Overall, I'm not so sure yet. It's too early to say. Indications should, uh, indications, early indications should tell us that we could see some more benign performance on the cost of credit, uh, particularly in the first half of 2020, but it's still early days. Next question from Thiago Batista, UBS. Low and growth achieved 15% in 2019. And 4Q19 showed a good surprise, especially in the corporate loan. Is this a level mid teens that we can see in 2020? Thanks, Tiago. Um, well, as you know, we have elaborated uh, during some time now on, on, on volume, volume evolution, and how we see these things. And, and we discussed this also, as you remember, on, on our investor day. Basically, uh, what we saw was that, that the change of mix that at that time in the, during the last couple of years has been a strong change of mix, as you know, in between retail individuals and what we would call corporates, large, cor large, large corporates, and even SMEs in, at some point, we thought and we see looking forward that it should kind of uh, equalize or close that gap in between growth, growth rates. Uh, uh, if we go back just uh, three, four quarters, we were growing above 20% on individuals in a flat or negative in corporates and large corporates. Uh, that has been that gap has been closing, and as you see this in this quarter, I, w I wouldn't extrapolate it, but um, in this quarter uh, we already see an equalization of growth rates in between different segments. Uh, how these will? Uh, how does this look forward? First, in terms of volume, what I would say is that this is a country that should trend to have a nominal GDP growth of around I don't know six, seven, eight percent, depending on inflation also, uh, which uh, leads to uh, volume growth in the high single, low double. Today, the country is growing at six percent, with a strong uh, change of uh, mix in between public and, and, and private banks. The banking debt is 48% of GDP, so uh, absolutely in, in, in uh, reasonable uh, levels and with capacity to uh, increase that leverage um, further to, I would say, in between 60 to 70%. So a space to leverage the country there is. And now what has to come is growth. When growth comes more intense, we are already in a growth mood, but when it comes more intense, 
investment plans will come once that industrial capacity that is today available is uh, partially used, both on the unemployment side and on the industrial side. So I would say this would be our, uh, it, it's basically what we said also in the investor day that uh, volume will keep on growing and closing those gaps in, in between segments. Next question from Marcos Asunción, Itaú BBA. On efficiency ratio, could we have a positive surprise on reaching the 38% target level before 2022? Marcus, hi, good morning. Thanks for the question. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, we are working towards that. I mean, 22 is not a goal in itself. The goal is, but it's going to be a function of how fast and how smartly can, are we going to be able to continue to transform ourselves. Today, I made the earnings release internally, and uh, I was using an anecdotal uh, picture of I, we have collected over 2,000 carimbos, and those who are Portuguese speaking know what that is. Stamps that used to be used by banks in the past with one's name and eventually the title. So the real challenge is going to be uh, how willing is the Santander Brazil culture and its human capital to continue to be at the forefront of transformation. I, My guess is that we're going to be on the forefront. I think there's quite a bit of from a cultural perspective, I think the people here, we are hunters. We, we go after business. We're getting smarter in the way we hunt. Uh, we are also, I think, learning in the way we manage risks, not only credit, operational, market, a variety of risks. So I would make, but again, I'm not the most objective one. I'll make a bet that we will remain uh, paying quite a bit of attention on the efficiency ratio, and that could happen before. And uh, then you had a second question, which I'm going to just accelerate, which is around declining spreads to be compensated by stronger volumes. I think I'm I think we're going to see a decline in spreads in the early days of the year. I'm not totally convinced. I'm talking spreads that spreads will continue to decline. I think we're going to see a reallocation of funding flows. I think funding will probably structurally become more expensive. So I think people will be pricing a lot more smartly than I think we have seen in the past years. I, there's still a lot of tendency to price product, um, but I think we have to start learning very fast how to price customers, duration, liquidity, which was something that wasn't in place a number of years ago. And it will become more important as we think. On the corporate segment, we are seeing a pickup in particularly in the small and medium segment, uh, more than on the large. So I think the recent pickup that you saw in the fourth quarter should be a good indication, at least for the first half of the year. I think I do expect that to accelerate uh, in the first half of 2020. Next question is from uh, Brita Schmidt, Autonomous. Can you please elaborate on the fee development in the quarter? What were the main drivers behind the asset management decline? And are you seeing increased price competition in this segment? Thank you, Brita. Um, as, as you probably, uh, as you have seen on the slide, what we have is an 8% growth uh, on 12 months and a decline on the quarter. The decline on the quarter is, is absolutely uh, what I would call a technical thing, which is it has to do, there you have two concepts. No? You have the asset management activity and what we call the um, uh, con consortio activity, which is a specific product being sold here, which is kind of a saving product that people use to buy assets in the future, and it generates fees. Okay, uh, this is an in-between quarter uh, kind of uh, adjustments that uh, you have because of the number of, of days, basically, and because uh, if the month ends in a weekend, those fees goes into the uh, PNL of the activity on a Monday. It's, it's a, 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 as easy and as, as simple as what I'm saying to you. So uh, if you saw, you saw a good growth in third queue against second queue, and now that good growth is playing the other way around in fourth queue. It's as, uh, as I said, as, as simple as, as what I'm saying. The important thing is that on the annual view, they are growing 
eight percent, and uh, it's both strong in both activities that uh, that I mentioned. Okay. In general terms, uh, fees uh, continue to grow in the high single digit. Uh, obviously, transaction will be transaction uh, transactionality will be important. Uh, looking forward for this uh, line, but uh, as has been mentioned, I mean we still see and we expect to continue to see to continue to see uh, a strong inflow of clients, both active clients and linked clients or loyal clients, and that means at the end of the day transactionality and fees. Next question is Yuri Fernandez, JP Morgan. Can you please comment on getting that volume growth recovery? It was up 18% Q on Q, which seems to point to market share gains. Which segment drove this growth? How are you seeing competition? Um, uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, well, we, we have commented um, GetNet, what is our strategy? And I mean, it's paying off. At the end of the day, this is a sector and this is an activity that, as we all know, has been, has, uh, been under intense competitive uh, forces. Uh, we have always said that our strategy was not size, that was positioning ourselves in a profitable way, gaining market share, but in a profitable way. We have triggered different um, innovations, let me call it like that, in the, in the sector with the D plus two, two percent that we already commented in the last quarter, or the small POS. I mean, I don't want to elaborate again on all it because, uh, but uh, GetNet is part of our offer. That's an important point. It's another product, also it's another company, another activity, etc. And if you see what is happening in terms of turnover and uh, transactions, uh, what uh, turnover is growing 11% while transactions are growing 16%, which means that we are more capable, we are more active per turnover. Uh, so I would say that the strategy has not changed. This is a structural strategy of uh, the group, uh, and we will continue, obviously, moving into an innovation mood as we speak. The floor is now open for questions. If you wish to ask a question via phone, please press star 1. Once your query is answered, press star 2 to leave the line. Each participant is entitled to ask one question. If any further information is required, please re-enter the line. Our first question comes from Otavio Tanganelli, Credit Suisse. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I wanted to ask about the, the, the spread decline that we saw in the quarter. Obviously, the volume growth uh, skewed towards uh, large corporate is negative for, for the mix, but I wanted to understand a little better if you're uh, not, not, it was not only an effect of the mix, but uh, if you're seeing some pressure on a line by line basis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the spread that you saw on the on the asset side uh, on this quarter has to do with that uh, mixed effect that I was mentioning before. At the end of the day, in past uh, quarters, uh, as you know, we have had, I mentioned it. Eh? We have had stronger growth coming from individuals and coming from the retail side. This growth has leveled, and when it levels, you you do not have that offsetting capacity or or effect on the spread. So uh, it remains what we have said, the spreads uh, on the asset side somehow with, uh, depending on the product, depending on the segment, but with some pressure. On the funding side, the other way around, we have been able to improve or to increase our spread, as you saw also on the same slide, even with, as I mentioned, with a selic that is at historical uh, minimums. No? But uh, I mean, uh, it has to do with mix and reality of the NIMs on the asset side that uh, I have mentioned this for some quarters already, you know, that uh, we expect them to, to be at least temporarily with some pressure. Our next question comes from Eduardo Hosman, PTG. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to ask two 
two questions, uh, actually about two statements that uh, Sergio, you know, made during the investor day, right? I think that the, the first one is, uh, if I if, if I remember, uh, I think Sergio, uh, he all mentioned that uh, banks, they need to move, you know, from a, let's say all you can eat, you know, to a menu type offer, right? So pricing the client well, you know, increase customization. So, uh, but my question is, I think that sometimes there historically, not just in Brazil, but across the globe, you know, something that did several acquisitions, right? So uh, I, I would assume you have like a lot of legacy, right? So how, how to do that, you know? Clearly, we can see that the mindset of the bank has been the correct one, focusing a lot on NPS and the quality of service. But, but I wanted to know uh, how, if you believe, you know, you, you, you are ahead of the other ones, right? And this would be the, the first question, right? And the second question would be, with regards to the regulator, I think that uh, Sergio mentioned that uh, he believed, you know, that the regulator, the central bank, would go more, let's say, on, on uh, auto-regulation, right, conversation with the banks, and we saw this cap on the on the overdraft, right. So I want to know if if the bank believes that this changed, that from now on it's natural, and we should see, you know, a, cent- a regulator that will do more kind of a adjustments like that, or if, if the bank continues to believe that it's going to be done, you know, more through auto-regulation and that these, these can be seen more as a one-off. Thank you very much. Hi, Eduardo. Thanks for the question. Uh, let's go with the first one. Uh, I think the biggest challenge today for companies of our size, but size here matters, is how you're going to be really be managing data. Lots of people talk about data, and that does not necessarily converse with profitability. So if you take, for example, uh, a company of our size, I'm going to give you concrete examples. Uh, We are basically migrating around 20,000 customers each and every month from our consumer finance to the more classic banking products. Uh, Until very recently, this same customer was being checked by the fraud group of the consumer finance and the fraud group of the bank as if that would be necessary. So what happens is today the challenge of cross-sell and the challenge to extract better pricing intelligence is actually around deconstructing cells that also sometimes see themselves uh, as with a unique role. Of course, that has changed in the meantime, because even the people within risk said, well, wait a minute, if this has been checked by the consumer finance fraud team, why do we need to do it again? That's the sort of attitude. If I do not create a culture where people are having that attitude naturally, the risk of uh, making it convoluted is very, very high. Second point, the chief data officer of Santander Brazil is a critical, critical uh, function. Uh, We're actually talking more and more about that function. Why is that? Everyone is going to what is normally known as data lakes, which is repositories of data and basically deconstructing what I would call the vertical organizational charts from a data point of view. Each area in the bank controls or deals with certain data pockets. The moment that you put all that data in a collective space, the real challenge would be how do you extract value out of that data? That's one. How do you stop doing queries and extracting value around customers from the past? How are you going to be able to actually mine that data lake much beyond your own product? So the whole governance around extracting value out of large depositories of data is going to be key for an organization like ourselves. If we can crack that code, I personally believe From a pricing strategy point of view, we're going to be ahead, which means in some cases, we're going to be far more competitive than the rest of the market. In some cases, not necessarily. We have seen that in practice in the consumer finance company. One of the reasons why we were able to jumpstart out of finance is that we became incredibly more smart, smarter in the way we were pricing customers. So I have the challenge is how I bring that now to 26 million customers. Not an easy not an easy task, but that's what it is. Second part, central bank. I, mean, I it's less about the central bank. It's really about the consumer as well. I mean, I mean, the consumer already <laughs> made that decision. If they don't see value, if we're not able to articulate well value, everything is up for grants. 
So I think uh, what I tell here is it's over. <laughs> it's really over. We got to have to earn and fight for each and every day inside of this organization to instill a culture that we want to uh, retain customers. I encourage you, and today I use that as an earnings release discussion, around the example of Amazon and Best Buy. Because everybody was basically betting that Best Buy would disappear in the U.S. for reasons that we already know. No, particularly the physical channel and all the rest that comes with the physical channel. And everything now, it's Amazon. And as a matter of fact, Best Buy did two very smart things. One, they created the so-called, uh, uh, what is square team, if I'm not wrong, the expression, which was basically groups of people, consultants, that would take care of your technology life. Your cell is not working, you go there and you get fixed. Your computer is not working, you get a new computer and you understand why your needs and what kind of computer would suit your needs. Then the second piece, what they did very well, is that they became an open space for any brand. The third piece was very much around customer centricity. Everybody talks about it. Very few people have been able to do it. We are trying. We are far from it, but we are obsessed that the experience of anyone with something there will be, on average, significantly better than any other place. And we believe that drives premium. That's the short answer. And I think Best Buy at Amazon, it's an interesting example of a violent transformation on the e-commerce space and a physical classic company that still exists despite the strength and the power of Amazon. Our next question comes from George Friedman, Citibank. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was looking into the evolution of uh, Common Equity Tier 1, and uh, even after paying strong dividends this year, we were able to come up with a very similar number uh, compared to the uh, fourth quarter of 2018. Uh, so just wondering uh, if you believe that you can keep uh, the payout uh, at levels uh, above 70% as historically, or uh, you know uh, if the convergence towards lower levels uh, could start to take place already in 2020. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, the, the level of uh, this is a kind of a triangle, as you know, that we always uh, comment in terms of capital level growth of rich weighted assets and payout. Um, we have always said, I mean, we are currently at 13% core equity tier one approx. Uh, we have always said that we feel capital level should be around 12 plus, 12, 12.5%, somewhere around there. That gives us enough space to grow, given the amount of profits that we are generating, uh, and to cover our needs in terms of um, uh, marginal needs in terms of capital. So uh, I, I will maintain that speech. In terms of payout, we paid an extraordinary dividend. I mean, extraordinary. We, we increased the, the total dividend in, in fourth Q, both due to the um, uh, to these levels of capital and, and what I was mentioning in terms of um, extraordinary profits, etc. But at the end of the day, the formula is going to be uh, capital level and risk weighted assets growth. My estimation is that we will have risk weighted assets grow in in the area of high single low double uh, for the next years, probably accelerating given the macroeconomic scenario we mentioned. Uh, that means that with return on equities above 20%, 21%, that the ones that we are having, you are leading to a 50% payout ratio. Uh, that 50% payout ratio continues to be our guideline. So this is our reference. But obviously, as we made last year, depending on the capital evolution and how we use our capital, we will adjust uh, considering the end game, which is the capital ratio level. But I would, I would maintain, for the time being, a kind of a reference around the 50%. Our next question comes from Marcos Assunção, Itaú. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, my question is on revenues from fees. Uh, there is a lot of uh, concerns from the market on that specific line, but uh, Santander uh, actually did very well in 20, 2019, growing revenues by 8%. 
my question is here is uh is it feasible for for the bank to continue growing above inflation and um how dependent this this potential growth will be from the heated uh, corporate investment banking segment that is already doing very well. I uh, did already very well in 2019, and it's already uh, uh, had a very good start of the year as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Well, th this is a direct um, formula. This is a, a direct relationship with first what Sergio was commenting. I mean, our obsession that a client is well served and it, it, it finds our bank as a, as a place, a common place where he wants to use the bank. So again, number of clients, number of active clients, loyal clients is clearly uh, related to this discussion. And the second one is uh, our uh, wholesale banking unit, which is, as you saw in the presentation, they had a a fantastic year being first in M&A, first in project finance, first in Forex, and they continue to gain speed and capacity. So uh, I would say um, fees should grow. Uh, I mentioned it before. No, I mean, if we continue to maintain that uh, kind of a strong pipeline in terms of clients and our positioning and our obsession in MPAs and all what I uh, was mentioned, I think that fees could maintain growth above inflation easily. But uh, uh, this is going to be obviously a, a difficult one, and it has to do with our capacity as a bank to position ourselves as a serving bank, as a bank that is really focused on service to clients. Our next question comes from Vitor Chagas, Bradesco, BBI. Hi guys, good morning. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I personally liked the example of Best Buy and Amazon that Rial spoke about, uh, and I would uh, like to follow up on, on this front. Uh, so Best Buy changed dramatically the way they operated their, their stores, uh, moving some of the inventories there for the, the clients to pick up, and this was a sort of game changer, not to mention the consulting services that they started to offer. Uh, and how do you guys see yourselves as changing uh, the experience of the branch, right? Because uh, nobody in general uh, talking here about the uh, new customers, or, or it's not new customers, the customers that are uh, the, the takers of uh, new technologies faster. These guys don't want you to, to really go to the branch or don't even like much the experience at the branch. So how are you guys thinking about changing this experience? how you could think about improving, for example, uh, the platform there, the branches for providing extra support to GetNet, for instance, because the Stone has its hubs in the merchant acquiring, uh, and the banks today struggle to, to develop a better distribution channel for, for merchant acquiring service, just an example. And in this, um, I'm sorry for, for making it that long, but in this scenario, uh, how do you see Centum there relative to the other banks in terms of IT infrastructure and how it could be a hurdle uh, or a challenge for you to implement new initiatives uh, and new solutions to, to customers, even this focus that we, we welcome uh, by uh, Centum there uh, in client centricity, focus on NPS. We really welcome the disclosure of this by, by the bank. So we would uh, be willing to get a better sense on, on what you could do better uh, in terms of user experience. Thanks. Okay, Vitor, uh, Sergio Real. So what I see as we call them branches, we actually, and, I, and you certainly use the word we use, we call them stores. We see them as a physical channel. We do see that as an important physical channel. What have we done in order to change what you call the experience? The first thing is, we have changed the entire coverage model inside of every store. And how have we done it? We deconstructed the organizational chart. In many places, you will not see tellers. In many places, you're going to see the space of a teller, but that person is not sitting behind it. It's actually on the forefront of the space. So the way we are reorganizing ourselves, that one, everyone sells and everyone gives consultancy in terms of what is the best course. It doesn't matter your position. Number two, there is a store manager. So that store manager has 
to get out of the day out of the desk because then that's when technology comes where you and we are working on that on having 100% of products and services being able to do it completely digitally meaning the customer goes there puts his puts his or her finger trip finger tip and that should be enough to have the product or services process so we are attacking all paper flow that exists inside of the organization second point uh, is moving away from selling which you need to still do but getting much more of a consultancy aspect for that in Santander most likely by the end of 2020 everyone will have at least CPA 20. last year we basically put the bar at CPA 10 around 700 people were not able to reach that level of financial uh, graduation, if you will. So the other component at the physical channel is that the quality, the technical quality of people has to become incredibly stronger. Other, other components, I would encourage you to visit our Work Cafe store. We have a Work Cafe store in Avenida Paulista. We also have one very close to Farol which is just another example of what I call segmenting your physical channel. We are gonna see uh, uh, stores totally designed for SMEs. You're gonna see stores very much designed for more investor type of customers. And you're gonna see stores like the Work Cafe, which is a combination of a classic retail and coffee, indulgence with experience. Um, so I would encourage you to do. So we're gonna continue to try to innovate different store levels for different experiences according to the region where the store is inserted. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eduardo Nishio. Mr. Eduardo, you may proceed. Thank you. The Q&A session is over and I wish to hand over to Mr. Sergio Rial for his closing remarks. No, I mean, um, first of all, thank you. I always say thank you for the coverage. Thank you for uh, making us a better organization with your comments. And that goes in particular to the sell side, uh, provoking, challenging, being constructively critical. Um, this is the fourth year. We continue. This is going to be an important year. Lots of changes happening in the Brazilian marketplace. And we'll continue to pay attention to some of the variables you've seen in the past. Profitable growth. That's one our people and transforming, making our people a differentiating factor, paying lots of attention to data and how do we extract value in, in that we can prove we can extract value out of that, moving from the technology bubble talk to the shareholder concrete talk, data to profit. Uh, last but not least, paying quite a bit of attention in the different channels from digital to physical, how we can optimize the distribution platform of Santander Brazil so that we remain an important engine of growth, but also of transforming uh, what used to be bank in something that may become a bank tech. No? So hopefully we do become more of a bank tech, which is the merger of a bank and a fintech. So with that, I really thank you and please continue, continue watching us. Thank you. Banco Santander Brazil's conference call has come to an end. We thank you for your participation. Have a nice day.